Good evening, and welcome to Chapter 4, where today we're going to talk about humidity, condensation, and one of my favorite topics, the clouds. So let's get right into it. It's we got quite a bit of material to cover for Chapter 4. So we're going to start things off with talking about an introduction to a, a few concepts. We're going to talk about water vapor, and we're going to talk about humidity. Now, water vapor, it's exceedingly important. And why is this the case? Because water vapor, that's the amount of moisture. It's a, it's a way we measure moisture in the atmosphere. So when we have a lot of water vapor in the air, that generally means that we got a lot of humidity. I'll talk about humidity here in a minute. But water vapor is exceedingly important because it transforms into cloud droplets. You know, we start off with a liquid, for example, on the Earth's surface. And then that, let's say the sun comes out, it goes ahead and evaporates that liquid. And that liquid, as it rises, this water vapor, this liquid turns to a water vapor. And as that water vapor, that air rises, that once again becomes a liquid. So water vapor is very important as it transforms into cloud droplets and ice crystals. The particles that grow in size eventually, and then those particles become so heavy that they, up, they overcome the force of an updraft, a rising air current, and eventually fall to the earth as precipitation. Humidity, this is the amount of water vapor in the air, um, and then it's not constant through time or space. So the humidity can change. For example, the highest relative humidities typically occur during the morning hours, right, right around sunrise, and then as the, as the air mass warms with the sun out during the day, by afternoon, that relative humidity may be much lower, and then once again come on the rise and increase uh, as we get after sunset. So humidity can be variable. Evaporation, I kind of just alluded to this in what I was mentioning. Uh, energy from the sun go, goes ahead and transforms enormous quantities of liquid water into a water vapor. As that energy from the sun, that radiation from the sun is received at the Earth's surface, it tends to warm that surface as it warms it, it tends to cause the molecules to move much quicker. And then that moisture, that liquid water, eventually vapor, it changes from a liquid to a gas, a water vapor. Condensation, this is when water vapor, as that air rises, the temperature eventually cools to the dew point, what we call the dew point temperature. And as the water vapor, that air rises, water vapor is going to eventually change back into a liquid forming what we see the visible clouds. And then there's precipitation. And that could be in the form of rain, snow, hail. And, and by the way, dew is not, I repeat, dew, I've seen it in some textbooks, but it's not correct. The dew is not a form of precipitation, by the way. So let's take a look at an example of the circulation of water in the atmosphere. Kind of looking at a graphical image here showing you how the water moves. So initially, if we were to have, I don't have a picture of the sun in this diagram, we do have a few clouds, but let's say the sun is shining in between these two clouds. As the sun's radiation or energy reaches the Earth's surface, we have oceans, we have lakes, we have rivers on the Earth's surface, and as that sun heats those water bodies, it tends to result, heats the land, the air wants to rise, and it goes ahead and warms these oceans, these water bodies. The sun will warm the water bodies, the air will rise, as the air rises it cools. So we go from a liquid to a gas, that is the water vapor, and as the air rises and cools, that water vapor eventually goes through the process of condensation going from a gas back to a liquid. And then if we get enough buildup in the clouds, the clouds get thick enough, we get droplets, cloud droplets that form, and rain droplets, and ice crystals. Once those become heavy enough, they eventually will fall to the Earth's surface, and that precipitation, once it reaches the Earth's surface, will then once again run off the land and eventually run back off into the oceans where the process all started. So this is Something known, um, you may have heard of this in science class in the past, known as the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. All right, so evaporation, we're going to talk about evaporation, condensation, and saturation. 
Evaporation again is the molecules changing from the liquid into a vapor state or a gas. So we go liquid to gas, that's known as evaporation. When we go from a vapor or a gas to a liquid state, that is what's known as condensation, right? So when that air cools, it eventually forms the clouds in the form of condensation. We did talk about in a previous lesson how I have a couple acronyms, Cool Mesa and Free CDs are a hot release. Um, condensation is one of those uh, changeovers that actually will heat uh, the surrounding air. Saturation, this is the total number of molecules escaping from a liquid, evaporating, and they're ba it's balanced by the number returning in the form of condensing molecules. Um, an example of saturation, we'll use this example, Imagine you're heating a pot of boiling water on a stove. Now once that liquid, that water, heats up to a certain degree, it starts bubbling really vigorously. And in that case, you'll see this little vapor rising above that the boiling water on the stove. And that is basically your water vapor. That's the total number of molecules escaping from the liquid due to the high energy of the water vapor molecules. But on the other sides of the outer edges of the pan, you will notice that there's certain buildup of moisture that's forming on the pan, and that is the condensing or the condensation molecules coming back. So saturation is a point where there's a perfect balance between evaporating molecules and returning molecules via condensation. And here is an example we're using instead of a pan, uh, we're using a jar or a glass jar in this example. Um, as you can see, evaporation results when the molecules move upward away from the water surface. We change from a liquid to a gas or a water vapor. That's evaporation. On the other side of this glass, you see that some of the molecules are returning via condensation. So in the diagram on the left here, we have initial conditions of unsaturated air. But on the right, these are the final conditions of saturated air, and basically for every molecule that's evaporating, another one is returning via condensation. So it's a fine balancing act. Um, evaporation is equal to condensation, basically, when you have a saturated air mass. All right, moving on to this diagram here, we're just showing you the differences um, in between the warm air A and then the cold air B. And all I want you to look at here is the molecules are much closer together when the air is colder on the right. So you see how everything is kind of clustered together on the right-hand side diagram, while on the left-hand side in warm air, warm air results in much more expansion of the air as a whole. When the air is warming, there's a lot more room for these molecules to move about, so they're much further apart when the air is warm as compared to cold air where they're much closer together. Now, there are certain ways to specify the amount of water vapor in the air. We have the absolute humidity, the specific humidity, and the mixing ratio. Now, with absolute humidity, this is simply the mass of water vapor compared with the volume of the air. Specific humidity is the mass of water vapor compared with the mass of air. And then mixing ratio is the mass of water vapor compared with the mass of dry air. Okay, so just remember those terms, what they are. And then we have something known as vapor pressure. And this is, uh, to get the actual vapor pressure, you're taking the actual vapor pressure versus the partial pressure of water vapor. And then saturation vapor pressure is the amount of water vapor necessary to make the air saturated at any given temperature. So just some terms to kind of keep in mind. So now we'll move into what we're most familiar with. If you watch the TV weather report, the news, if you watch the TV news, the weather portion of the news, you'll hear the meteorologist typically say the relative humidity is, and it's typically in a percentage. And what, is, what does that meteorologist mean by that? Relative humidity is simply the ratio of water vapor in air to maximum amount of water vapor required for saturation at that particular temperature and pressure. So when we talk about relative humidity, Colder air can hold much less moisture than warmer air. So if we have a higher 
for example, we have a higher temperature, the air technically can hold more water molecules, so it would take a lot more moistening of the air mass for saturation to be reached and higher relative humidity in a warmer air mass. A colder air mass, on the other hand, the saturation can occur much sooner. Um, the capacity for the air to hold moisture is much less in colder air. Um, so if you ever notice on a colder morning how, especially on a clear, cool, cold night, you typically have a lot of dew. Or if it's cold enough, the ground temperature is below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you have frost. And that's an example of this. Um, basically, relative humidity is the ratio of the air's water vapor content to its capacity based on its temperature as well as its pressure. Now, the relative humidity is changed by vapor content of the air temperature. Increased water vapor content will increase the relative humidity. So, for example, today, where I live, the dew points were 76 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very muggy. Very tropical air mass in place. Um, and so, as the day went on, you know, that the temperature kept rising. Uh, there was increased water vapor content, the air could hold much more moisture, so therefore it was feeling much more muggier in the afternoon. There is decreased temperature, a decreased temperature will cause an increase in the relative humidity, it's an inverse relationship. So if you cool that air column down, generally temperatures get cooler, the capacity of the air to hold moisture becomes less, and therefore there's an inverse relationship there. All right, so here are your temp, now I want you to pay attention to this. So um, on the y-axis, we're showing temperature. So you see the green curve is your temperature, um, and then you've got your relative humidity is the red curve. Notice the times in the bottom of this diagram, midnight to midnight the following day. So basically it's a 24 hour snapshot of how temperature and relative humidity are kind of like inverse relations, all right? So if you notice down towards sunrise, I mentioned that's usually the cooler time of the day, the coolest time of the day around sunrise, around 6 a.m., 5 to 6 a.m. Notice how the temperature dips to its lowest point, the red line there on the left, around 6 a.m., but the relative humidity reaches its peak height, or it's basically reaches its peak overall, highest point. So you can see this inverse relationship between temperature and the relative humidity. Look at during the daytime now. Look at in the afternoon between noon and 6 p.m. particularly. You will notice that the temperature is reaching its highest point around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 p.m., while the, while the relative humidity is much lower. It reaches its lowest point around the same time. So temperature and relative humidity are inversely related. If you increase one, the other one goes down because warm air has a much greater capacity to hold moisture as compared to cold air. Now, relative humidity and the dew point. I did just briefly mention about the dew point temperature. Now, the dew point is the temperature at which saturation occurs. And it's usually, you'll see it in degrees Fahrenheit. Anything less than 60 degrees Fahrenheit is usually much more comfortable. Once you get 65 degree Fahrenheit dew points and higher, the air becomes muggy. This is when you go outside and you sweat relatively quick. You feel like, wow, this is humid today. It's really humid and muggy out. The good, uh, you know, dew point is a good measure of actual water vapor content. Uh, you will see drop-offs or changes in dew point temperature, especially in the vicinity of frontal passages, uh, cold fronts, warm fronts. We'll get into the frontal passages later on, but I just wanted to mention that. Now, dew point, the difference between air temperature and the dew point, that, where does dew point come in with relative humidity? Well, this third bullet really explains it. The difference between air temperature and the dew point can indicate whether the relative humidity is low or high, okay? Now, if you have a large spread between your air temperature and your dew point, the air is dry and the relative humidity is fairly low. On the other hand, if you have your air temperature and your dew point close together, the atmosphere is very moist, and this is a case where the relative humidity is very high. This diagram shows you the relative humidity, the average percentage. Now remember, relative humidity is in percentage. So if you notice in the January time frame across the United States, the greener areas, for example, Miami, into Florida, the Gulf Coast states, um, those, those relative humidities on average are anywhere from 40 to 60%, sometimes higher down in South Florida in January. 
Whereas the farther north you go, for example, look at the Midwest. There's a 20% average relative humidity, for example, around the St. Louis area. And then look even further north than that, up towards Fargo, North Dakota, where the average relative humidity is much less. Why is that? It's because the temperatures are much colder up in the northern states, okay, during the winter time in January. And remember our rule, the colder the temperatures, the less capacity for the air to hold moisture. So therefore the relative humidity is much, it's lower overall. Now, let's take a look at July now. This is a big difference here. We still have the highest relative humidities down on the Gulf Coast. And you, you know, those of you that live in the Pensacola area or anywhere in the Gulf Coast, New Orleans, anywhere in Florida, you notice how muggy it is day after day in the summer because the average relative humidity is so high. New Orleans and Miami, for example, have average relative humidities greater than 70% during the month of July. And that 60% relative humidity line actually goes all the way up north of New York City, even into the Midwest, southern Wisconsin, southern Minnesota. All right. And then look at the West, on the other hand, in July. Look at Reno. Around the Reno area, you're only at 40% average relative humidity. So that really shows you the differences between the winter and the summertime as far as relative humidity goes. And again, in order to calculate the relative humidity to determine whether it's high or low, we need to look at what's known as the um, temperature dew point, air temperature dew point spread. All right. So all that is is the difference between your temperature, which is abbreviated in this diagram with a T, the T, little lowercase d, that's your dew point temperature, okay? So when those two are exactly the same, in this example, in the cloud here, we have a temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit. We have a T, D, or dew point temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, the exact same um, value. That indicates we have reached saturation in the atmosphere. We have relative humidity at 100% and the air can no longer hold any more moisture. And when we have saturation, that's usually when we get clouds to form. A lot of times we'll get precipitation as well. Look in the base of, below the base of the cloud there, where it's actually raining. There we have a temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and a dew point temperature of 65 degrees Fahrenheit. That still gives us a relative humidity of 84%. Now, here's your question. Do we really have to have 100% relative humidity to get uh, precipitation to reach the ground? The answer is no. Uh, precipitation can reach the ground when the relative humidity is below 100%. So you don't necessarily have to have 100% relative humidity to see any rain or snow at the surface. Now, what about relative humidity and human discomfort? Um, I, you know, working outside sometimes in the summertime, especially when you're cutting the grass or doing yard work or just you're trying to go out and just maybe get some kind of exercise in, you'll notice the relative humidity has a big, big impact on how we feel each day. So when air temperature and relative humidity are high and the air is nearly saturated with water vapor, our body moisture just does not readily evaporate from our skin. It collects on the skin in the form of sweat or perspiration. The wet bulb temperature that's the lowest temperature reached by evaporating water into the air, by the way. I just want to throw that out there, uh, the definition of wet bulb temperature. And then heat index. Typically, we'll see this uh, you know, on the local forecast in the summer during really hot spells of weather. You'll hear heat index values approaching 100 degrees Fahrenheit, upper 90s, lower 100, stuff like that. The heat index basically takes into account both the air temperature with the relative humidity and that determines an apparent temperature. And I'm going to show you the chart right here. Here is an example of the dew point, or actually the heat index chart. Sorry about that. This is the heat index chart, okay? So you can simply calculate um, heat index values by looking on the y-axis. So you see 80 degrees at the bottom, and you know how it goes in the vertical, how it goes all the way up to 120 degrees on the left. At the top there, across the x-axis, we have 20% relative humidity all the way up to 100% relative humidity. Now, 
we can calculate what the heat index is or what it feels like based on hot temperatures and the relative humidity. So let's look at 86 degrees. You notice 86 there, it's one, two, three, four. It's basically four blocks up on the lower left. 86 degrees is your temperature. Now, let's say the relative humidity is at, oh, 80% with a temperature of 86. You would simply move your finger over along the 86 degree row to you match up with 80% relative humidity, which you would by basically going down from 80, and that would give you a heat index of 100 degrees. If our air temperature was 86 degrees Fahrenheit with 80% relative humidity, the heat index is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's exactly what it would feel like outside. What about 96 degrees Fahrenheit? So you wanna go up there to 96 degrees Fahrenheit on the left. It's almost the middle of that, those white blocks there. And then you, let's say we have a relative humidity of 60% with a 96 degree Fahrenheit temperature. You would move your finger horizontally straight across the 96 degree row until it meets up with 55% relative humidity. That's a case where your heat index feels like 112 degrees Fahrenheit. Now look at the right hand side of this diagram. We're showing you possible heat-related risks to the human body. Um, if it's that the reddish shading here on the diagram, those, uh, those heat index values would be extreme danger. Uh, this would result in heat stroke or sunstroke. It's very highly likely if you stayed out in those conditions too long. Danger would be in that more like the rosy color there where you get sunstroke, muscle cramps, and or heat exhaustion likely. And then the orange color is extreme caution, where sunstroke, muscle cramps, and or heat exhaustion is possible. And then finally, that little the lightish yellow color there in the bottom left, that is caution fatigue possible. So you really got to be careful when you're out and about during the hot summer days with high relative humidity. All right, so now how do we measure humidity? What kind of instruments do we use to measure humidity? There's something known as a psychrometer. And this is, I'm going to show you a picture of it here in a minute, but this is two liquid in-glass thermometers that are mounted side by side and attached to a piece of metal that has either a handle or chain at the end. And then the other instrument we can use to measure humidity is known as the hygrometer. Now there's three types of hygrometers that you can look at using. Believe it or not, hair hygrometer, hair can be used in measuring humidity. So basically, the longer the hair strand, the higher the humidity. The shorter the hair strand, the lower the relative humidity. So that's really interesting. Electrical hygrometers, just what it says is electrical. It's an instrument you can plug in. And then a dew point hygrometer. Okay. Now I want to show you what a sling psychrometer looks like because this is one of the more common instruments we use to measure relative humidity. So you notice it has two liquid in-glass thermometers one side by side. There's one on the top, there's one on the bottom. Um, so basically what we're doing is it's got a handle this person's holding. The top thermometer with that little muslin wick, see that white cloth on the end of it? That's a muslin wick. Um, basically what you do is you would dip that into a little bit of water so you moisten up that white cloth there. Um, that's going to give us our wet bulb temperature. Okay, The bottom the bottom thermometer there is just your regular air temperature, just like you know if you were to go outside with a thermometer, it gives you the air temperature. So what you do is, this person's got a grasp on it, you can't really see it, but there's a handle there. And you would basically spin around, you would wet that little muslin wick, that white little cloth area on the top thermometer there, that's the wet bulb, that's gonna give you the wet bulb temperature. But you would just basically swing, you would swing that psychrometer around, just pivots around in a circle, and you do it for a certain period of time and a certain amount of moisture is going to evaporate due to air circulation off that muslin wick, that white cloth. And that's going to give you a wet bulb temperature. The bottom value will be the air temperature again. And there's actually a table that allows you to look at the wet bulb temperature versus the dry bulb temperature or the air temperature. And that's going to give you the relative humidity. So it's a pretty, pretty cool instrument. Here is an example of what's known as a, uh, this measure relative humidity on a cylinder, okay? Um, you notice there's a, um, a amplifying lever, 
uh, there is um, basically a pen, that yellow, that yellow instrument there going horizontally, the yellow bar. That's recording the relative humidity over time, known as an ink trace. Okay, So you can actually do a written record of the relative humidity that way. Now we're moving on to, since we talked about humidity, saturation, now we're going to actually talk about something known as dew and frost. Now these are very common. Now if you've lived in the northern states, you've seen both. Uh, if you've lived your life mainly down in Florida or along the Gulf Coast, the southern states, um, it does get chilly some mornings in the winter for sure. It can get down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's not as likely for you to see frost in those locations. So what is dew? Dew forms on objects near the ground surface when they cool below the dew point. And dew is most likely to form on clear nights when you get that really good radiational cooling. So the long wave Earth radiation is readily escaping from the Earth's surface. That lower level there, especially the grass blades, those are cooling much more rapidly than the overlying air. And as those grass blades cool, they eventually cool to the dew point temperature where saturation is reached, uh, or condensation is reached in the liquid water, and you get very wet grass. Um, white frost, on the other hand, forms when the dew point temperature is at or below freezing, and this typically forms in the wintertime on cold, clear, calm mornings. Sometimes you'll see coatings on the grass. Sometimes you'll see them on the rooftops. Sometimes you'll see them even on the window panes. Okay, so this is what dew looks like. You can see those individual water droplets as the air cools to the dew point and, and condensation occurs where you go from a gas to a liquid and that liquid is visible on these grass blades. This is an example of frost. Okay, So you see kind of like the unique patterns that frost creates. Almost looks like feathery, a feathery nature. In addition to dew and frost, let's talk about haze and fog. So haze, you typically see haze in the summertime when it's hot and humid. But haze is a layer of particles dispersed through a portion of the atmosphere. And haze can have a restriction on the visibility overall. Fog, I know anybody in the Gulf Coast in the wintertime, I was down there for a few years, that was one of the biggest things you got in the wintertime. You get these long nights, short days, and what happens is the air cools, and you get a lot of fog down the Gulf Coast states in the wintertime. And it's very thick, especially in the Florida Panhandle area and into southern Alabama. Uh, fog is, uh, you know, basically a cloud that is resting on the ground. And it's considered fog when the visibility lowers to less than one kilometer or 0.62 mile, uh, 0.62 of a mile. And the air is wet with millions of tiny floating water droplets. All fog is is a cloud on the ground. It's, and sometimes when you're in the fog itself, you can kind of see these little, tiny little water, water vapor, water droplets kind of floating in the air. It's almost like mist. So let's take a look at it. Here is what, um, here's an example of fog over a unfrozen, this, this body of water is not frozen, okay? So you get the cold air that flows over this um, water body, and what happens is, the air becomes saturated to a certain level and fog forms. Um, I know it says frost in this image, but I'm really tempted to say that looks more like snowpack to me, some kind of snow cover on um, some logs there laying in that water, that unfrozen water. It looks more like it's a snow cover. Uh, not a whole lot, but maybe an inch, an inch of snow on those logs there along the water. And then if you look on the right there, um, to the right in this image with the fog over the land, you can see, you'll see that white coating. So that to me it looks more like a snowpack, believe it or not. All right, so fog. This is an interesting subject, okay? And, you know, you see Hollywood use it all the time in their scary movies, right? And we're coming up, you know, scary time of year. But fog is basically formed in one of two ways. Through cooling, where air is cooled below its saturation point or the dew point, fog can form that way. And then also evaporation and mixing. Water vapor is added to the air by evaporation. Remember we said evaporation was conversion from a liquid to a vapor or a gas. And the moist air mixes with relatively dry air. So there's two ways 
Those are the two ways that fog forms. What types of fog are out there? Okay, we have radiation fog, advection fog, upslope fog. Okay, now radiation fog typically forms over land. I want you to think of land when I talk about radiation fog. This is simply produced by the Earth's radiational cooling. The long wave uh, radiational cooling from the Earth after the sunset. All right. Typically, you want longer nights. Uh, for good radiational cooling, you want clear skies, light winds, nearly calm winds will also work. Advection fog is a much different animal. Okay, This is when warm, moist air moves over a sufficiently colder surface, and that moist air may cool to its dew point or saturation point. Here's an example. Um, you know, I went one time with the United States Coast Guard. I went sailing with them. Um, I was providing weather support to the ship. We went from Hawaii all the way up into the Bering Sea, and we were up there from July to September. As we continued our transit from Honolulu, Hawaii, up to the Bering Sea, we had a persistent southerly, southwesterly wind. That warmer, moist air was blowing over relatively cooler water, and we always in the Bering Sea, it seemed like day after day, we were socked in with advection fog. So advection fog, I want you to think of warm, moist air moving over a cooler surface. My example, it was warm, moist air moving over the cooler waters of the Bering Sea between July and September. Advection fog, you have wind. You have a transport of warm, moist air over a cooler surface. It can also be a cooler landmass. Um, radiation fog, on the other hand, you want light winds or nearly calm winds. So there's a difference between radiation and advection fog is the strength of the winds. Now upslope fog, just what it, what it shows, upslope meaning we have some kind of mountainous or higher terrain. This forms as moist air flows up along an elevated plain, hill, or mountain. Um, so you could be driving one time on a road trip up through some higher mountains and you may actually run drive through some upslope fog the higher you get. So let's take a look at some examples, okay? So this particular example here, this, since it's so much lower in elevation, it's not towards the top of this elevated plateau. This would be more of a radiation fog at the base. It looks to me like towards the valley, the lower points of the hills there. That is what radiation fog would look like. One of the most famous locations in the United States that gets advection fog is the city of San Francisco, a great city. This, I'm showing you the Golden Gate Bridge. That's the top of the Golden Gate Bridge, by the way, right there in the picture. But look how socked in the San Francisco Bay is with these low stratus clouds or fog, just socked in uh, as warmer, moist air from the Pacific blows over the colder waters of San Francisco Bay. That forms vection fog in that bay quite frequently. Here just explains to you the differences between radiation on the left and advection fog on the right. You notice with radiation fog, um, long wave earth radiation, that long wave earth radiation is moving away from the earth's surface, escaping out into space. <clears throat> In the process, the land, uh, basically the temperature cools down to the dew point temperature. You get higher relative humidity, saturation reached, and you get a cloud to form on the earth's surface. On the right, Look at that flag there on the right. That flag is showing that there's some form of wind. It's extended. See the flag? Again, you need wind for advection fog. You want lighter, calm winds for radiation fog. That's the big difference between the two. All right. And then upslope fog. This is when you get moist air. It's rising up over higher elevations, and it forms as the air rises, it cools to the saturation point or the dew point and you typically get what's known as upslope fog. All right, now evaporation, and we also call evaporation fog mixing fog, is formed by the mixing of two unsaturated masses of air. Uh, you can get example would be steam fog, which forms when cold air moves over warm water. And I'm from the Midwest initially, and I'll tell you, I've seen steam fog in action quite a bit, especially in the very first, you know, beginning of fall when you get that first really chilly air mass that tends to move into the Midwestern states. 
And I've seen it in people's backyards. I've seen it over rivers. <clears throat> I've seen it in people's backyards over their swimming pools. Um, the water's still relatively warm from the summer. You get that first shot of really cool, chilly fall air. It blows over the top. It's basically over the top of the warmer water. So colder over warmer. And that tends to form steam fog. You start seeing these vapors coming off of the uh, pool water. It's really cool. You can also see it in lakes and rivers in the Midwest when you get those first couple really cold shots of fall air. And then precipitation, frontal fog. There can actually be frontal fog. And this is very common in association with the warm front. We'll get in the warm front discussion in much more detail in a later chapter. But just realize as precipitation falls around a frontal boundary, it's going to result in an addition of moisture. You're going to get higher relative humidity and you get fog which develops in the shallow layer of cold air just ahead of an approaching warm front or behind a cold front. So around frontal systems, <coughs> precipitation fog can also be there. Here's an example of steam fog. Check that out. See how, how it rises like a vapor off the waters there? It's pretty cool. It's really a cool thing to see in, in person. All right, so now let's talk about foggy weather, dense fog. Where is dense fog most common? It's prevalent in coastal margins, especially those regions lapped by cold ocean currents and near the Great Lakes and Appalachian Mountains. That's where you have dense fog. Um, and it also causes extremely limited visibility and, you know, fog is one of those weather phenomena that can really hamper flight operations at airports. You know, you ever flying through some cities, get these long layovers and delays in flight. Sometimes you get cancellations if the fog is, is so dense and thick, you, the pilots can't see down the runway. It's just not safe for flight operations. <clears throat> Here's an example of the foggy weather in the United States. Um, just wanted to show you um, the different types of fog as well. So you have the number of days with dense fog. You see that legend in the bottom right of this diagram? The darker the shading on the map, the greater the frequency. So the darkest shading is greater than 59 uh, days a year with dense fog. Uh, the lighter the shading, um, that's usually less number of dense fog days. Um, but generally, um, we're showing you, you know, topography comes into it, geography, where are your mountain ranges, um, you notice uh, in the eastern U.S., for example, into western North Carolina, western Virginia, into West Virginia, we have more than 59 days with dense fog because of the Appalachian Mountains. That's the upslope fog. Look on the Gulf Coast states. Destin, Panama City, Pensacola, Navarre Beach, over to Mobile, Biloxi, and in New Orleans. There is a darker gray shading there. That's that evection radiation fog, and that's the, that really hits the Gulf Coast states, especially with long nights in the shorter days of winter. Um, upslope fog, again, you notice out there over the Rocky Mountain states. And then you got some radiation fog in some of the higher elevation areas of California, and there's advection fog immediately along the coast. As I mentioned, San Francisco, California, the picture of the Golden Gate, and shrouded in fog is the advection fog type. So now we're going to get into one of my favorite topics, okay? If there's anything I want you to take away from this course, I want you to become a forecaster. I want you to become that meteorologist to forecast the weather. And this, this, clouds, is one of the most important topics to really grasp because by just observing the sky, seeing what type of cloud is up there, you can really help forecast the weather yourself. You can do it yourself by just looking at the state of the atmosphere. Look at that skyscape. All right. So what is a cloud? Before I show you some pictures of some cool clouds, we're going to talk about the definition of a cloud. It is a visible aggregate of tiny water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the air. That's exactly what a cloud is. It's either water droplets or ice crystals just suspended in the air. Classifications of clouds, stratus, Cumulus and nimbus. Stratus, I want you to think layers. Cumulus, those are the cotton balls. Those are what you see on a hot summer day. They kind of build up with height throughout the day. And then nimbus, N-I-M-B-U-S means rain producing. 
The primary cloud groups are actually identified by height. There's high clouds, middle clouds, low clouds, and then there's clouds of vertical development. Within each cloud group, cloud types are identified by their appearance. So a gentleman by the name of Luke Howard in 1803 developed the cloud classification, the grouping of clouds, the names of clouds. For example, he used Latin terms such as cumulo, which means heap, or cirro, which means hook shapes, to classify clouds of what he observed in the sky. Here are the four major cloud groups and their types. High clouds include cirrostratus, and you'll see the abbreviation for the clouds in the parentheses next to the cloud type. There's cirrostratus, cirrus, cirrocumulus. In the middle cloud group, we have altostratus and altocumulus. There is a little typo there on altocumulus, so ignore that U on the end of that. I apologize for that. Low clouds include stratus, stratocumulus, and nimbostratus. And then the clouds with vertical development, cumulus, and the big granddaddy of them all, Cumulonimbus, that is our thunderstorm cloud type. That's what produces all the crazy lightning and thunder, the heavy rain, uh, your downdraft, gusty winds, all that. All right, so here are the approximate height of cloud bases above the surface of various locations. I want you to know one thing here. The height of the clouds is dependent upon <clears throat> what region of the Earth we're talking about. So... The high clouds, for example, are lower in the polar region as compared to the tropical region. Why, why is that the case? Why in the polar region are the clouds lower on average in height? It's because in the polar regions, the atmosphere is much more compact because it's so much more colder in the polar regions. So the clouds, therefore, it doesn't take nearly as much time for those clouds to develop and form due to saturation. In the tropical regions, on the other hand, look how high the cloud uh, groups are. You know, tropical regions much warmer, um, much more expansive. As air is heated, it wants to expand. It wants to be much, much larger in volume. So you typically have higher bases of clouds uh, in the tropical regions. In the mid-latitude regions where we live, it's generally like between the, where the cloud heights are for the tropical regions to the polar regions. So just realize that. It also varies by season. Um, during the winter time, your cloud bases are usually lower. Your cloud groups are lower than they are in summer. Now we get to have some fun and take a look at some really interesting clouds. All right, this image here is what's known as cirrus clouds. Notice how wispy they are. And they're made completely of ice crystals. Why is this? Because they typically form well above 20,000 feet in the atmosphere. So there's really no liquid. It's so cold up there at those heights that um, there are ice crystals up there. Here are cirrocumulus. Sometimes we call these the macro sky because they're resemblance to fish scales sometimes. Um, very woolly-like. You, you can see how woolly the patches look. See how small the individual elements are? They're really tiny. Um, these are also made of ice crystals on the high group, high cloud group. Here is a cirrostratus cloud. The one cool thing about a cirrostratus cloud is it actually forms, you see this large circle around the sun in this image? That is known as a halo. And we'll get into the discussion on halos and what forms them in the optics section. <clears throat> but I just wanted to mention, if you see a halo like this around the sun or the moon, you are looking at a cirrostratus cloud as the light is refracted off the hexagonal or six-sided ice crystals, that forms the halo effect. So ring around the sun or moon, you, that is a cirrostratus cloud, that halo. Now we're moving into the middle cloud groups. The middle cloud groups are composed of both water droplets and they can be composed of a mixture of water droplets and ice crystals. In this example, these are called altocumulus clouds. Not much spacing between them, not much blue sky between them. They're clumped together pretty good. And here is an example of altostratus, okay? So one big thing I want to point out, cirrostratus, the light of the sun or moon, you have a halo, a ring around the moon. Not only that, but you can see your shadow. When it's a cirrostratus cloud, you can see your shadow on the ground. 
Alto Stratus, on the other hand, <clears throat> you cannot see your shadow on the ground. The sun's light is much more dim or faint, so there's really no shadow effect. And then look at these little individual cumulus, um, kind of like <clears throat> below the alto stratus in this image, just little gray little patches. Those are the cumulus clouds, but we're mainly focused on the sheet-like look here of the alto stratus clouds. Here is an example of stratocumulus clouds. They are simply cumulus clouds that are more flat, they're more layer-like. And then this is fog. <clears throat> we already talked about fog and why it forms. Fog is simply, this is a stratus cloud. It basically um, goes all the way down the Earth's surface, makes driving and flying airport operations very difficult. Now we're in the low cloud groups. We started with stratus and now we're moving into cumulus. These are the type of clouds you typically see on a hot summer day. So these would be your cotton ball clouds. Um, in this image, we're looking at fairly flat cumulus clouds, which indicate a very stable atmosphere. <clears throat> Fair weather. Here's an example of cumulonimbus. So these are the clouds that eventually result in thunderstorms. The grandfather of all clouds, cumulonimbus, thunder, lightning, thunderstorms, heavy rain, sometimes hail, sometimes tornadoes. And here is an example of all the clouds in one image. Um, starting at the bottom, you see the stratus, the stratocumulus, the cumulus. Okay, um, Nimbostratus is also um, usually starts out as a mid-level cloud, and then as it as it rains or snows, <clears throat> the Nimbostratus cloud actually lowers in elevation. Um, and then we go to the mid-cloud group. You have alto cumulus and alto stratus. And again, the alto stratus, the sun is dimly visible. You really won't see a shadow. And then the high cloud group above 23,000 feet, those are your high clouds, cirrocumulus, the macro sky, the cirrostratus forming that halo around the sun or the moon. And then cirrus, those thin, wispy looking clouds, looks like hooks. On the right, look at on the right. We got a lightning bolt coming down out of this base of this thunderstorm. That cloud that goes from the low group all the way up and the vertical to the high group is known as a cumulonimbus cloud, the thunderstorm cloud. Now, not all clouds can be placed into the basic cloud forms. We do have some unusual clouds based on unusual circumstances in the atmosphere. The first cloud is a lenticular cloud. Okay, um, These are usually lens-shaped clouds. Some people have mistakenly reported lenticular clouds as being UFOs, believe it or not. Lenticular clouds typically form in the areas downrange, downrange of mountain peaks. Peleus is a very striated, very fibrous looking cloud, typically at the top of thunderstorms. Um, it's really cool. I have some images coming up, so hopefully I'll have a Peleus cloud to show you. Mamatis clouds, these are pouch-like looking clouds. I do have an image to show you here. I can see it. It's coming up two slides, I promise. Mamatis clouds are typically associated with very severe thunderstorm activity, strong to severe thunderstorms, and uh, they generally look like eggs. Um, some people refer to them as cow udders. I'll show you that here in a minute. It's a really cool cloud. Contrails, these are unique in that airline pilots, jets, high-flying, high-altitude passenger airline planes. Um, as they fly, they tend to release a stream of water vapor that comes out the exhaust. And if the atmosphere is moist enough, it will actually form a cloud in the wake of the exhaust from jet planes. I hopefully will have one for you that, to show you that. <clears throat> we have na nacreous cl uh, clouds and noctilucent clouds, which are way high up um, in the atmosphere, well above the troposphere, in fact. <clears throat> okay. This is an example of a Peleus cloud. Uh, remember I was telling you of striated, fibrous, bright, sitting on top of a cumulonimbus cloud. And it's not the puffy part of the cloud, it's the actual top, the very top that's very, it's very fibrous or very bright. It's basically the cap or the top of that cumulonimbus cloud. That's called a Peleus cloud. These are Mamatis clouds. You may have seen these before. This is really cool stuff. 
These look again like cow udders or some people call them like little egg shapes. But whenever you see the Mammatus cloud like this, hopefully you're not in a plane because this is associated with extreme turbulence. If you see a Mammatus cloud and you're in a plane, you are going to be bumped around quite a bit. Um, most pilots try to avoid these type of clouds, uh, the uh, Mammatus clouds, just not a safe cloud. Um, you really have some significantly severe weather in the area with thunderstorms when you see the Mammatus cloud. And this is Contrail. Well, we do have it. I'm so happy. Um, so you see in the right-hand side of the picture, that's the actual jet. Um, could be an airline, airline plane. Um, right behind you, you see this long white vapor trail as the jet exhaust comes out. Um, it cools and saturates and forms a a uh, little trail-like cloud, and that is a contrail. Contrail, by the way, is short for condensation trail in the wake of a plane. All right, <clears throat> so now we're wrapping things up for Chapter 4. Just one more topic we really need to hit. And that is clouds and satellite imagery. Since we talked about clouds, we must also talk about satellite imagery. So how do we see clouds? We look at it via weather satellites. Um, right now, the GO-16 is the latest geostationary operational environmental satellite, and the resolution and detail is phenomenal. If you get a chance to Google G-O-E-S, GOES, 16 imagery, Google that and you will be amazed at the detail. Um, a weather satellite is a cloud observing platform in Earth's orbit. It's orbiting above Earth. It provides extremely valuable cloud images of areas where there are no ground based observations. So, Tyros 1, 1960, was the first weather satellite launched into space. Up until 1960, we had no way to tell a hurricane was coming. No way. Um, we had no weather satellites until 1960, believe it or not. And once we got weather satellites in orbit, we can then sense where the clouds were, even over the remote locations of the world, such as the oceans, where there's no weather observing stations. Uh, geostationary satellites orbit the equator at the same rate the Earth spins. So with geostationary satellites, or GOES, we call them GOES for short, G-O-E-S, um, those satellites tend to appear to be staying in one place and take snapshots of um, certain locations. They really don't move because they're orbiting at the equator. They're orbiting above the equator at the same rate the Earth spins. Okay, So they appear to remain fixed in one location. Polar orbiting satellites, they closely parallel Earth's meridian lines or the longitude lines. And I'm going to show you some examples of the orbits now of both the GOES, the geostationary satellites, and the polar orbiters. Here's the GOES, all right, generally at 36,000 kilometers above the equator. We have multiple GOES satellites around the world. We have uh, GOES-16, um, we used to call it GOES-East, uh, and then we have GOES-West, which, you know, we're getting a new, I think it's GOES-17 is the next one coming online. Not quite online yet. We're still using the older GOES-West, um, but basically, these GOES satellites are orbiting at the same rate the Earth's rotating. See the little blue arrow around the Earth in this image? They remain. They appear to remain fixed in one location, basically, because they're orbiting that purple circle area, that or elliptical orbit-looking thing. That shape, that is the satellite's orbit, and it's, it's basically moving at the same speed that the Earth is rotating. So there you go. Um, with the polar orbiters, on the other hand, these generally, um, you know, you have the Earth rotating beneath them. Um, there's two types of modes with polar orbiting satellites. There's an ascending mode where the satellite goes from um, south to north. And usually they're, they're limited in their longitude swaths. So you see how there's little miniature little stripes, lit stripes. Those are the longitude uh, paths or coverage that the polar orbiters take. Ascending nodes or modes... Generally, the polar orbiter is going from south to north, and then descending nodes is, or modes is when the polar orbiter is going from north to south. Okay, Very limited coverage based on this lighter stripe of white. Um, as the Earth rotates beneath them, that swath continues to move westward over time. So, 
Continuously improved detection devices such as satellites make weather observations more versatile than ever. Uh, can't say enough about this, uh, this weather invention, the satellite. It's come in huge role to protect life and property. Contemporary satellites use radiometers, can observe clouds during both the day and night. There's different types of imagery we typically look at. Visible imagery, satellite imagery during the daytime when the sun is out, it relies on reflected light. And then we have infrared imagery, which we can take a picture of day or night of the clouds. Uh, information on the cloud thickness and the height can be deduced from satellite images as well. Infrared images produce a better image of the actual radiating surface because they do not show the strong visible reflected light. So, you know, IR imagery <coughs> is really good for detecting temperatures of surfaces in particular. So in summary, wow, we went through a lot of stuff today in chapter four. Uh, in summary, dew point temperature is a good indicator of air's actual water vapor content. Remember I said below 60 degrees Fahrenheit is usually feeling very comfy. Above 65 degrees Fahrenheit feels muggy. Um, condensation above Earth's surface produces clouds. So clouds are a result of condensation. Condensation is a conversion from a vapor or a gas to a liquid. Clouds are classified according to height and what they look like, the physical appearance. <clears throat> and then satellites enable scientists to obtain a bird's eye view of clouds on a global scale, even over remote locations such as the oceans. And satellites can be observed, the clouds can be observed in both day and night with infrared and visible satellite imagery. We have wrapped it up. Congratulations. We made it through chapter four. Introduction to Meteorology. Um, looking forward to continue on this exciting journey of weather. Continue to hang in there. Let me know if you have any questions along the way. I wish everybody a very good day. Have a good one, everybody.